exist anymore. We're poorly configured mail servers. Unfortunately, not all admins are as good as us, right? So there's going to be poorly configured mail servers. Also, open proxies and poorly configured proxies that proxy out, proxy not only web traffic, but they open up other ports for mail as well. So these are all attributes to spam. As of 2007, January, Verizon, Serverflow, and AT&T are the top three networks sending spam. So let's talk about the circle of spam. Uh, one, you've got the spammer's website, whether it be a Viagra website, uh, Xanax, uh, Xanax, uh, eh, that ain't working, uh, Xanax, whatever drug that they're selling, Okay, and then of course you have the spammer. The spammer is going to be the mail server. And they're going to send out the spamware to your PCs. Your PCs are going to get infected with them and send mail out to other mail servers, which are going to hit the users and send them to the spammer's website. This is what we consider the circle of spam. This is actually taken off the, the internet by Fubar, Fubar of Fusco and Admiral Bolts. Uh, there's a new trend. The new trend is you're actually going out and downloading, you're actually going out and downloading the virus or Trojan, and you're putting it on your PC. If anybody here, and I'm going to ask for a show of hands, anybody here goes for a, a no CD key, a crack, a cheat, a serial, and you download it, you could probably put on a no key CD crack that's sending out spam. I've actually had multiple instances of this just in the last six months where I've seen it, and it's definitely sending out spam. You're getting the RBLs. We'll talk about the RBLs. So let's talk a little bit about the types of spam that you see. There's about three different types of spam. There's corporate spam. Now, corporate spam is kind of a gray area. It's somewhat tolerable. You go to a mortgage site, you sign up for you know, the best mortgage rate, and the next thing you know, they share the mailing list with uh, about 50 million other people, or they sell the mailing list. So this is somewhat tolerable because you want the information, but it becomes burdened on your email server and your email account. Fraud spam, Nigerian 419. This is the most popular. I'm a rich, repressed uh, Nigerian man. I need help getting out of the country, all my millions of dollars. Please help me. I get three or four of these a day sometimes. I used to. And just plain phishing. Phishing's where eBay sends you a hey, guess what? You know, you got to validate your information. Go to this website and type in your account information. They're phishing. You're not actually going to eBay. IE7's actually got a new phishing filter in. It fishes out whether or not they're sending you to a legit site or not. So it's getting better, but we're still seeing the spam. Typical spam. Typical spam is Viagra, mail enhancement, pump and dump. Pump and dump is something new, trend over the last two years. Pump and dump is actually penny stocks. What they do? They go out, they buy stock in the company, they send pump and dump saying it's going up Monday, come on guys, buy. And by the time you buy, it's already too late. They pulled out and made their money. And we're seeing a big trend to this. This is actually a targeted campaign now. They're actually targeting you and concert, or basically focusing their efforts on one company. So there's some legalities in all of this, but I'm gonna tell you why they're not helping. There's OPS or AUPs, acceptable use policies of ISPs. But the problem with this is that if you have a contact management solution, which a lot of these people claim they have, uh, it's kind of a gray area. Okay? It's somewhat acceptable use. You're buying a service. You're buying a service on a server. Uh, you're sending out to four or 500 people a day, but that's your business. They've committed to that business. It's kind of tough. Can Spam Act of 2003, and despite uh, lawmakers controlling uh, the assault of non-solicited pornography and marketing act of 2003. Soliciting pornography and marketing is not what spam means. Spam actually originates from the Monty Python skit, you know, where he goes to order something and they keep telling him everything has spam and they start singing spam, spam, spam. Okay. There's U.S. computer crime statutes. Uh, says that spammers can't install viruses on your computer. It's illegal. Article 13 of the European Union Directive and the Australian Spam Act of 2003. These are all ineffective because it's very difficult to find these people. 
So let's recap. Spam's going to get worse. Your neighbors are spamming you. Spamming techniques are now organized, and they're making focused efforts on individual companies. And some types of spam are somewhat tolerable, so it's kind of tough. Laws aren't being enforced enough, so where do we go from here? Oh, we become vigilantes, right? We take it into our own hands. And one of the things that we can do to be vigil and make sure that uh, you know, we're stopping spam is one, email filtering, and two, virus checking. Okay, actually three things, and tighten security. When we email filter and virus check, we're checking stuff coming in. And that's you know, what you thought this was all about. Okay, but tightening security is something often overlooked. It's called egress filtering. Nobody ever egress filters. You go out, you buy a cable router, you stick it on your line, right? Great, I'm protected from all the stuff coming at me. But what happens when you get something on your PC that goes out? Nothing's stopping it. So the only machines that should actually connect to a mail server on the outside of your company is your email server. So you should be egress filtering port 25. So if a client gets a virus, they're not spewing out and your IP isn't going to get blacklisted in a DNS PL. So these are all areas overlooked, but in best practices. So how do we email filter and virus scan? Well, I like open source. Why? Uh, not because I don't like buying new stuff and being held to you know, the manufacturer's uh, development cycle. Okay? I kind of like taking the development cycle into my own hands and modifying it. But the thing is, they're highly configurable. One of the products we're going to talk about today is Mail Scanner, totally free. Spam Assassin, Clam AV, Vipel's Razor, Pizer, and DCC. The DNSBLs and the RBLs, something called Rules Du Jour, Mail Scanner MRTG, and some open source scripting. So, what does typical corporate email server look like? To our typical corporate email server, you've got your internet mail servers out here, you've got a firewall, we talked about that, and your exchange server sitting back here. You're going to allow port 25 to come in and Basically, the only options that you have now, if you want to scan, is basically installing something on the Exchange server. So that's all good and fine, but the Exchange server is already overburdened with you know, 300 people hitting it. If you've ever looked at a Microsoft deployment, they have some pretty intense resources. So the last thing we want to do is put email and virus scanning on the same unit. The other thing is, that actually opens you up to a denial of service attack. Okay. So there's some things that uh, Microsoft's actually provided. It's coming out in 2007. Uh, smart screen technology, or IMF, and semantic antivirus, of course, is uh, another product, third party. So the best solution is to actually put in a gateway in between the mail servers out there and your exchange. You're still going to allow 25 in, but you're only going to allow it to your gateway. This way, mail scanner will actually focus on scanning the mail and the viruses, and Exchange will focus on just serving the clients. And this is the best solution. Now, there's some major components to a gateway, and that's actually what I want to discuss in some detail with you, because a lot of these are critical. And if you skip one, I'll tell you some of the problems throughout that, uh, that you'll find yourself in. So you'll notice mail scanners at the heart of it all. There's another product called Amazvid New, if anybody's familiar with that. It's actually an excellent product as well. I've worked with both. There's Postfix, DNSBLs, MRTG, Clam AV, Spam Assassin, which is going to be the heart of your spam checking. And then there's some plugins, DCCs, DNSBLs, there it goes again, Rules Du Jour, and then some external scripts that'll help Mail Scanner do some things that will, will help you later on. So, what is Mail Scanner? Mail Scanner is actually an open source application that ties other well-known open source applications or spam fighting utilities together. Mail Scanner is free. Mail Scanner is actually maintained by Julian Field of Southampton University, and it's extremely flexible. So Mail Scanner actually has a built-in phishing engine, and we actually check our own mail through this because when we go to send out mail, we don't want it to be perceived as, you know, Spam. So we'll actually look at the checks that Mail Scanner does on our own email when we send out 
you know, hey, you know, this event's going on at PPI. Uh, Mail Scanner can actually sniff out renamed executables, which drives my entire network team crazy because, hey, great, you know, you can't send me EXEs. Rename it to TXT. Eh, still going to sniff it out. It's still going to see it as an executable. It actually uses a Unix file command. So it's going to actually see that executable. And if you have a policy, no executables, no zips, it's going to strip it out of email. Pornographic email can actually be stripped out and offensive content taken out. So this way, office lady doesn't pull up an email and go, oh my god, okay? That can actually be pulled out and just get URLs. So if you really do want to take a look at what's under you know, that URL, you can click on it still. Spam actually can be tagged, rejected, discarded, archived, or forwarded to another address for inspection. I, I tell you, don't do that. There's legalities there. But tagging is actually what you want to do. And there's a couple different things that you can do with Mail Scanner. We do a pass and tag tag and pass. So what's under the hood of Mail Scanner? Well, you've got everything external here. There's SMTP, your mail servers out there on the internet sending you mail. There's the MTA process on your machine, some file directories, and then there's Mail Scanner. Mail Scanner can do the RBL checks, spam assassin checks, the virus checks, the attachment checks, like I told you, and other content checks that you see fit. You can actually create these as plugins and put them in. And then you'll put them back into the file system and your MTA will send them out to your Exchange server or Lotus server. So MUAs, MTAs, MDAs, right? What the hell? What are all of these things? Well, if you read the RFC 2821, they define simple mail transport protocol. And pretty simply, it, it's confusing if you read the article, actually. But MUAs are the user agent. Outlook, Pine, Mutt. Uh, might even be the worm or virus if you installed on your laptop trying to get the new CD key. Okay, You put the key in, bang, it just sent it out. That part is the agent, the part that you function with. The MTA is going to be Outlook, or uh, rather Exchange, Postfix, SendMail, Exum, QMail. These are all MTAs, popular MTAs out there. MTA could also be that virus or Trojan you've installed on your PC. It's silently sending out mail. MDAs are the delivery agent, and we don't really see that other than when we configure you know, an ISP's POP server. You're connecting to that MDA. So look at a bird's eye view of MUAs, MTAs, and MDAs. You've got a person here, Alice. And I, I stole this from the internet, so I'm not sure who the source is. Uh, Alice's MUA could be Outlook, or Outlook Express could be AOL, whatever. It's going to call the sending MTA on Alice's machine, or the server, whoops, the remote server for her ISP server, and it's going to send that information out through port 25 to the destined server. The destined server is going to put it into the MDA, and the MDA is either going to put it into a database or a file structure into Bob's mailbox. Bob is going to start up a client that's configured with IMAP, POP, or NFS, and Bob's going to retrieve those messages. So really what we want to do, there's two types of, of, of email spam, spam uh, blockers you can put out there. One is out in the port 25 range, watching it as it comes in. The second are those products that you can actually purchase you know, that tell you, hey, you can install this on the client. You don't have to worry about your ISP's poor tactics of combating spam. You can actually install this in Outlook. The problem with that is that the mail server is still going to be pulling in spam. So again, it opens it up to a DOS attack or denial of service attack. And those products usually get installed on the MUA. And they're somewhat effective. So I'm going to talk about Postfix. Postfix as an MTA, I've used SendMail and Postfix. I've tried to shy away from Exum. Exum is another one. I've also used QMail as an MTA. Basically, the MTA is going to be mail transfer agent on the gateway, and it's going to accept mail in on port 25, and it's going to put it in a directory. Now, that directory, you're going to tell Mail Scanner to watch. And Mail Scanner, when it sees mail in that directory, it's going to pick it up, and it's going to process them. When Mail Scanner is done, depending on what rules or policies you've set in place, 
it's going to put that mail back into a file system directory, and the same postfix process is going to pick that up, and it's going to send it out to your Exchange server. So the nice thing with this is we have one process we mess with. Now, you could actually set up two instances, okay? But then you'd have to manage two config files. The other thing with Postfix, highly configurable, real easy. SendMail, SendMail's highly configurable and it's very rich, but the problem is those darn macro files. It's confusing, it's probably one of the most confusing products I've ever worked with, but it's highly configurable. Postfix, real simple, little text file, tell it post, Postfix, reload, bam, you're up and running. Clam antivirus. I just got a call on this yesterday. Somebody was looking for an open VMS antivirus utility. ClamAV actually has a port for it. Very rich product, been out there a number of years. Its main focus is actually email and virus scanning. However, it's also used as a client system or an end client system. And can automatically update by default. I think it's set to every hour. They only release virus updates and actually the definition files every day. Um, Mail Scanner itself can actually support Clam AV, I think natively, and it can actually support 20 other AV clients, uh, both corporate and open source. And you can actually run your mail not only through Clam AV, but through all 20. So depending on what richness of the rules that you want, maybe something isn't getting caught by Clam AV, you can throw it into Semantic, you can throw it into Sophos, okay? Those are just a couple of the big names. Spam Assassin. This is the heart of what I'm seeing a lot of corporate email gateways out there, okay? They're selling you a product or you're going to your ISP and they're using Spam Assassin. This is an open source project by the Apache group and it's very mature. It's actually in its third major revision. Has over 750 heuristic checks. I'll show you that here in a little bit. Can use DNS BLs or DNS block, black hole lists uh, Bayesian filtering, which is kind of unique, because, you know, Viagra and enlargement might not be terms. Whoop. Okay. Check. <laughs> We're back. Uh, Viagra and enlargement, I guess the mic system didn't like. Uh, Viagra and enlargement might not be terms that you want into your corporate facility because, let's say you're a law office, but let's say you're a pharmaceutical company. And Viagra is the main product that you deal with, and enlargement of tumors is something that you see every day. Okay? These are terms that you can custom tailor the Bayesian filtering database to actually give you a point system or give you a scoring on the email or the content of the email either way. Now, the problem with it is, is people are Bayesian poisoning now, and they're sending you, you know, blurbs of text, like, my grandmother made me cookies, right? And it's actually spam. So they're actually poisoning this. The good thing is, is that the way the scoring works inside a mail scanner, it doesn't just take one score and say, hey, this is spam. You actually set a high water mark, like a five or a six, and depending on whether or not you hit the DNSBL, you might score a three. Depending on whether or not you hit the Bayesian, you might score a one. And it's that collective score that'll actually be called spam, okay? And then you can even set a high water mark that's stuff that really is spam. You know, I mean, the true Xanax and Viagra and drug ads, you can just drop that. So you actually have a couple different options with Mail Scanner. Uh, Spam Assassin can also use something called Digital Checksum Clearinghouses. And these are Razor, uh, Pizer, DCC, okay? These all focus on taking a cryptographic algorithm or a checksum of a piece of mail and comparing it to what's perceived as spam in a public database. So the problem here is that database is public and it's free. And it's actually a good thing because you can use it, but it's a bad thing because the spammers have access to that as well. So they're going and they're doing the same thing. They're called hash busting. They're going out, they're checking to see if, whoops, I think I'm gonna have to hang this up. Uh, they're going out, they're going out, they're checking the databases, seeing what checksums match spam and they're poisoning those databases. So it's kind of two, two camps out there on the internet. Some that rely on DCC and say it's a good thing and then some say, nah, it's a waste, it's going away. And I'm kind of tossed up. This one's actually scored pretty low in that scoring system I was telling you about. 
However, Razor actually looks at mutating emails and the signatures, and it's a little more advanced than the other two projects. So I set up all three when I build a box. There's SAR. SAR is the Spam Assassin Rules Emporium. And this is stuff that Spam Assassin doesn't catch, okay? Tactics that people have taken to get around Spam Assassin, the DCCs. People actually go out, figure out their own corpus or the way they're going to catch the email, and write a rule. So what you find in these rules is actually well-known phone numbers, so like pharmaceutical companies or you know, mortgage companies, well-known email addresses that are tagged with spam, phrases, URLs, and other tactics like the pockmarks, you know, Viagra spelt with a one instead of an I. So that's what these rules are all about. And they're pretty darn effective. Um, SAR rules are actually updated through a set of scripts called rules du jour. So you can custom tailor what you're looking for. And there's different, you know, different rules out there for different things. So there's financial rules. There's phone number rules. There's actually a, uh, a blacklist rule, which is now a DNSBL. Uh, SAR is actually updated pretty frequent. It's not daily. It's weekly or monthly, sometimes every six months. But it's another tool. And then DNSBLs, I keep talking about this. And DNSBLs are about the best thing since sliced bread. Uh, that's, that's a bohack catchphrase. Uh, DNSBLs are actually DNS databases of offending IPs. Now, the reason why they're so sweet is because I had no method uh, about four or five years ago of catching IPs that were dynamic. Okay, so you know, cable modems, DSL networks. These guys should not be sending you email directly. They should be sending it to their ISP's server, and their ISP on a static IP should be sending it to your corporate mail server. So the person that's running a spam campaign from a DSL line should be shut down. Well, the only people that track dynamic IP pools are DNSBLs. And you can actually go out there. Serbles is one. Uh, Maps is another. There's a couple uh, pay for. Some are pay for. Most are free. A lot are donationware. There's a lot out there, and you can actually tie Mail Scanner, Spam Assassin, or your Postfix MTA in on this. So the way it actually works is you just type lookup, and you'll reverse the IP. 24.7.7.124 used to be my cable modem IP when I was on Comcast. Uh, I don't know who it is now. We'd reverse that to 124.7.7.24.multi.serbal.org. And if you receive an answer, it's spam. Now that answer will be like 127.00 and a number. That number, usually Serbals will give you a lookup table. And depending on what number it is, it's what group or category that IP is listed in. That IP is listed in, you know, uh, worms and trojans, OK? This IP has been seen as sending out a lot of spam, and it's possibly a worm or a trojan or an exploit. Uh, it's dynamic, uh, dynamic or dull. Um, a dial-up list, which they're usually not dial-up lists, but that's what they used to be called, a dynamic IP list. Okay. The last product is MRTG, and again, open source, totally free. Uh, I find that most admins put up you know, a virus scanning gateway, a DNS unit, uh, put in a router, and they never do the next step. They never get any reporting on it. So when they run into trouble, they're like, What's going on? And actually, to tell you the truth, that's what shies a lot of, a lot of administrators away from Linux, because there's no GUI, right? I don't know how many of you are Windows or Linux administrators. How many of you have a background in Linux and Unix? OK, sweet. I feel like I'm in company now. All right. All right. Most administrators that operate Windows networks, they're shy of this. That's why they, they say, hey, you guys, Linux, no, 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 no. We'll go out and buy a product, OK? Because there's no reporting. They can't give something to the executive officer and say, hey, look at our spam trend. Look at it over the last year. Well, MRTG actually gives you that functionality. They've adapted it for mail scanner. And it's a beautiful thing because I can actually get the mail relay daily, spam identified in that mail, the virus is caught, uh, how many processes are running of, of the MTA, the copies of mail scanner, and they'll fluctuate. Uh, Files in the incoming queue, the outgoing queue. This will show you work stoppage or shortages. Okay, So this is really nice. And I can actually zoom down so we can actually see trends with this. This is just an overview of what's happening today. 
we can actually zoom down and look at one of them, and we can look at it daily, weekly, monthly, or yearly. So I can actually print this report out for uh, uh, an executive and actually show them. And I say, hey, look at the little picture. We're under attack, okay? This is why you're seeing a lot of spam. So this is often something that I find Linux administrators just go, hey, you know what? I'm at the controls, no problem. I know what's going on. But you need some kind of form of, of looking at what's going on at a glance. So you could see, hey, this is the reason why it's taken five minutes for somebody to send an email inbound. It's because the incoming queue is stuffed up. Hey, let's go take a look at what's wrong. Maybe restart the process, get the system back up on its feet. So you can do that from a console prompt, but if you're away enjoying something, right, your junior admin go in and look at these. So problems with gateways. This is a major problem. Another thing that's overlooked, it's the marriage of Unix and Windows. But Windows is pretty, pretty nice because the email server, the Microsoft Exchange server, runs on a Windows platform, a Windows domain. That's mostly what corporate America runs. Uh, LDAP queries. Let's LDAP in. Let's LDAP query it. So all we have to do is get an LDAP client on the mail scanner, create some scripts, usually in Perl, and tell Postfix on the mail scanner to use a recipient map. And what that does, it takes all of the email addresses off this corporate mail exchange server, and it dumps them onto this mail scanner gateway. And now you're telling MTA, don't bring in email if the person doesn't exist. Otherwise, you're processing email whether you like it or not. And what I've seen over the last two years, actually probably three years, is something called HBAs. And these are harvest, harvest block attacks. They're denial of service attacks if you, if you want to think of it as a denial of service attack. But what they're actually doing is the spammers are out there and they're going through a set of random strings and they're seeing if those accounts exist on your mail server. Like joe123 at foo.com. Sorry to use foo, but it's the only one I know of. Uh, joe123 at foo.com, right? If your email server takes it in, then that address is valid. Well, the problem is if you don't set up anything like this, your gateway is going to bring all that mail in no matter what. And you're going to process hundreds of thousands of emails, and you don't need to. You put that list on the mail, sc mail scanner gateway, and now you're rejecting Joe123. And they'll actually go through, it'll be a, 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 like usually a word list that they'll go through, and they'll find accounts. So where can we get more information? Well, mailscanner.info is actually the, the project that I spoke about here today. I've actually got a demo, and I was hoping to have enough time to actually show you the demo. Um, Mailscanner.info is the home of this product. And again, Julian Field of Southampton University. Uh, it's also home of the big yellow book. Uh, they sell a, a yellow book that talks about all of the configuration. Everything's well documented. The wiki for Mailscanner.info, which is a great installation wiki. A great, perfect setup for Debian Etch. Etch just was released April 8th, and I, I, I love it. Uh, it's actually solved a lot of problems. Um, what was it? Uh, Sarge was out before. I'm a mil minimalist kind of person. I like to install just what you need. Uh, and I found that Sarge installed a whole bunch of junk in the, uh, the internet daemon that you didn't want. So you always had to pull it out. This etch I found to be beautiful. Easy setup, but there's actually a great how-to for the perfect Debian setup. And I usually follow it up to the point of quota. And I'll show you that here in a minute. And then, of course, my website, which is bohack.com, but I got to admit, I'm not free, okay? I don't solicit business, but if you run into something and you need consulting, I do charge, so. And then, of course, my sponsor, which is PTI, and uh, it's just product placement. That, they're the people that brought me here today, so. So let's test drive the system. Now, one of the things I do as an instructor is I actually run multiple computers at once, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with the buzz term of uh, virtualization or virtual PC, but I love virtual PC. I like VMware too, but virtual PC is free, and it's by Microsoft. It works with all their Microsoft products, and it works with Debian too. Uh, what I have running here is Domo, okay, and Domo is the domain controller and exchange unit, and 
These are all local on the machine. They all have a, uh, an RFC 1911 private IP address space of 192.168.13 or, or something thereof. This is actually the exchange unit, the Active Directory. And I'm going to go into Active Directory. And I haven't fancied it up. I'm going to go and copy this user. And I'm going to create a user 3. So setting up an email box for this user. And there's the email box. Again, Exchange is running on this system. So the email box was just created. This is user 3. I had user 1 and user 2 there. I'm going to close that out. And I'm going to go into my Outlook Web Access. It just happened to be the easiest MUA right, that I could put on this machine. And I'm going to log in as user 1, the existing account. And there's an overburdened Microsoft Exchange server right there for you. It's running IIS. It's running Exchange. It's running Domain Controller. If anybody's ever worked with a small business server. By the way, I'm not running Vista. This is a skin. I don't know how many of you have had exposure to Vista, but, right? Yeah. Yeah. There's uh, Mimo. Okay. Mimo is the gateway. This is running mail scanner. Go ahead and log in. Yeah, I know I'm logging in as root. I should not be doing that. This too is okay. Uh, a box that's running on a 1911, or I'm sorry, uh, RFC uh, 1918 address, and it's all private to this machine. But this is actually running the mail scanner and the mail gateway. So what we're going to do is we're just going to watch. I'm going to watch the syslog. I'm going to watch the mail log. Okay. We'll just watch this mail log here, and that's what was left in there. So let me just put a little delimiter. And then I've got Climo. And Climo is going to be our client. Again, it's a Debian box, just because this was the smallest footprint for a mail server I could actually, or a mail client that I could create. And I'm going to run MUT here. I'm going to create a new little email here to user1 at foo.com. And the test is going to be right now. I'm going to say test. I'm going to go ahead and send that off. And it's going to send it straight to the postfix MTA. It's actually doing some DNS lookup right now. I've got a DNS server running on one of these. Okay, the MTA is going to pull in that email, and what you see down here is Mail Scanner actually scanning that email, and it's saying, "Hey, one uninfected email," and it's delivering that one email to the user one at foo.com. And there's a number of, or uh, a number of inf pieces of information that are going to actually be tied to that. And then you're going to see the postfix process or the egress process deleting it out of the queue. And we'll check the mailbox. Again, an overburdened exchange unit, right? The reason why we want a mail gateway. If you've ever read the specs, it's unbelievable. There's our test message. And you know, on this, we've actually added a footer that says, hey, this message has been scanned for viruses and dangerous content by mail scanner and is believed to be clean. We can easily substitute this with any message we like. That's the beauty and flexibility of mail scanner. I've actually chosen to remove it entirely when something's good. So we've got a working system. Now, let's take a look at, not on the client, but MIMO. OK. Let's take a look at the postfix directory. 
pretty, pretty small number of configuration scripts, right? If I was running SendMill, I'd actually have, well, I'd actually have a, basically the same number, it'd just be the main configuration that I change would be in a different directory, and there'd be a lot more of them. If I look at my main.config, it's as simple as this. And actually, since the last version I've used, they've added in the TLS, which is layer security. But right there is my recipient relay maps, okay? And it's going to tell it, before you accept any mail, please check this recipient table to make sure that these users exist. And that script that I talked about that interfaces with the exchange unit, I'll show you here, that populates that relay recipients map, okay? There's a transport map that basically tells it what destined mail server to send it to, our exchange or our Lotus server. There's a header check. The header check is actually useful because we don't have to create a second MTA for the inbound mail. What we'll do is we'll do header checks on incoming mail, and if they match incoming mail, we'll drop them to a hold queue, and we'll tell mail scanner to watch that hold queue. Mail scanner will process whatever's in that hold queue, throw it to the incoming queue, and the MTA, the outbound MTA, will pick it up and process that, send it to the transport, which is the destined exchange gateway or exchange unit. So you can set up what you'd like to relay from. Like sometimes I like to relay from the server farm. Okay, in this case, I just said 192.168.10. Um, local recipient maps, we can actually put in DNS BLs right here. So we can actually tell postfix on incoming mail, check a black hole list or real-time black hole list in RBL to see if that exists, that IP it's coming from exists. If it does, just deny it at the door, okay? That's a little risky because if somebody ends up, and I've actually had this instance, if somebody mistakenly ends up on an RBL, you're denying it at the door. You're never going to accept mail for that. So it's kind of risky. But what you could do is you could put in dynamic uh, IP lists, okay? Say anything coming from a DSL or a cable modem IP pool, just drop. There's something called a bogan list, which is bogus IPs that are, should not be routed anywhere. ICANN or uh, IANA have not mapped them out to anybody that's responsible for them. So they end up on something called a bogan list. You can definitely add a text file here and throw that bogan list. So what is in that relay recipients map? Right now, if you notice, the last two are user one and user two. Now, there's some others up there that Exchange puts in by default, okay? Like your offline address book and a couple others. Uh, user one and user two were the two valid accounts that I had on this domain up until I created user three. There's a nice little Perl script, and it's out there. It's out there on the internet. If you read one of those wikis, you'll find it. You'll trip over it. That's actually user local bin and the get. LDAP SMTP. This is a little script that you can install Perl, install the LDAP client, and I tend not to like PAN, but uh, you can actually uh, add this in Debian with an ATT get, so that's pretty sweet. Add in an LDAP client, we set up our domain controller, our base where our users are at, okay? One of the users that's allowed to access the uh, LDAP and the rest of the script, it's only about 225 lines, 300 lines, uh, maybe 400. Uh, we'll basically pull it out. You can actually add in custom examples. So if you have something that isn't in your Exchange unit or Lotus, Lotus, Lotus Notes unit, you can actually add in addresses here at the bottom. And that's just a, a print statement. They're commented out right now. Now, if I were to do a get, oops. Switch the directory first. Get, that, get LDAP SMTP. And that's printing it out to a file. Uh, if I do an update, which all this is, is a number of scripts tied together. Whoops. There it is. Okay. 
All this is doing is changing directory in a postfix, running the uh, postmap command. Oh, I'm sorry. There it is. Running the git ldap smtp, changing directory, going in, running the postmap command, okay, and then telling it to reload. And I actually set this for like every half hour, every hour. Some servers I set it for every day, depending on the number of users that get added daily. If we go to our postfix directory and we cat that recipient list, you'll notice that user 3 is now in there. So this is the marriage of Linux to Windows. We can actually do this. If you don't do this, what you're going to do is you're going to accept mail for everybody that harvest block attacks you. Okay? And this is a problem. It takes that mail server, and what you're going to find is you're going to have it in place for a couple months, and then all of a sudden people are going to start complaining that it takes a half hour to get an email from an outside contact, okay? Because you're processing everything. That's true if you also install these spam fighting utilities on Exchange as well, because Exchange is overburdened, as I always say. So, let's take a look at the mail scanner config. The mail scanner configs are pretty sweet. We got a number of file name rules, we got a number of file type rules. We can actually add in custom functions. Now one of the, the functions, I haven't quite played with it yet, is you can actually limit the amount of emails that you receive from a particular geographic location on the globe. So you can actually say, I only want to receive 500 to, to 1,000 emails from the RIPE network or the, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of another one here. Uh, I haven't memorized these. Uh, RIPE, well, Aaron, uh, Blacknick, Latin and South America. Okay, and you can actually limit the number of emails that you actually bring in per day. And you can set it per hour. You can do all that. That's all in the custom configs. I haven't quite played with them yet, so I'm not very familiar whether or not they're successful. Otherwise, I'd be talking about them today. There's a country domains, okay, and that's where each you know, country has their IPs. Uh, there's an auto-update functionality. The phishing and safe sites. Some sites fish, not because they want to, but because they have to. I think Chase Bank is one of them that sends email in behalf of another party. And then the virus scanner configs, where you actually plug in virus scanners. Now, the main config for mail scanner is well documented. I'm just going to scroll down through it. What's nice about it is you can actually tell it what user to run as. And you can actually tell it to run as postfix. So if somebody exploits the mail scanner, they're not going to get root. They're not going to get keys to the kingdom. They're going to get postfix. Postfix has enough you know, rights to actually spam, but not give over your entire network. So I'll tell you what. That's pretty much all that I have other than a couple short links. One of the links is, of course, you set this up. You want to test this. ICARS, which is a test string that you can throw in an email. I've actually put a space in there so my virus scanner doesn't pick it up. Um, ICARS is a test file, an antivirus test file. If I throw this in here, uh, before we end, let's go ahead and actually send a virus through this system, see how it handles it. And then I'll open it up to questions. And I'll click into it. To user1 at foo.com. Subject is test of 149B. And I'll paste that string in. Edit, paste. Hopefully the virus scanner doesn't pick this up. Save that out and send it along. So that was just sent. Now, iCars, and you'll actually see when I save this, my virus scanner will say, hey, what are you doing? It deletes the file. So, so much for the iCars. So, we get a good valid test for viruses. There's also one for spam called GTube, with a generic test for use. 
And there's its string. Whenever a vir or a, uh, an email gateway or scanner sees this, it should react and say, hey, you got spam. User 1, I'm picking on this guy today. Foo.com, the subject is what? test 150, and this is spam. Go ahead and paste in the G2. There are actually a number of services that will actually test your service as well, including if you sign up for a mortgage company. Bang. And, okay. So we just sent those two off. On Domo, got to check my email, on the overburdened exchange unit. There are our emails we just sent. One spam, and it's saying, hey, this virus has been scanned. It's been passed. It's actually been something called tag and pass. So we've actually changed the subject to, hey, is it spam or not? You can actually put a rating system in here. You can actually put a numeric system so that the, the, the user actually knows, hey, what's the worth of this email? Uh, scale of 5 to 10, OK? If it's a 10, it's probably spam. I'm not even going to open it. It's a five, maybe it's my friend putting in some terms about malenhancement or Viagra. Maybe I gotta read it, right? Virus, that's pretty cut and dry. And mail scanner will actually pull out the attachment. And again, I tell you, don't save these things for people to pick up. If they're viruses, they're viruses. You know, it's like the Windows 95. Hey, I need my file back. I need it repaired. It says it's a virus. Well, guess what? It's a virus now. It's not a file. Okay, there's no way to, to get that file back. So just delete that. This will take it out. And it'll actually even s save an attachment if you tell it to. This one's just default. It just deletes it and says, hey, this is a virus. If you want to complain, call your IT department. And they left a, a blank link in there. So I tell you what, at this point, I'm going to shut down here. And I'm going to open it up for questions. Any questions? Yes. Bless you. Uh, well, the nice thing is overburden exchange units and Lotus Notes units, you're not going to get away from, OK? But and I knew somebody was going to answer this question. The mail scanning gateway is not going to be overburdened at all. Uh, I, I run probably about 80,000 emails through a 2.4 core, uh, not a dual core, but uh, 2.4 hyper-threaded processor with about 2 gig of RAM. That's a pretty meaty box, but on today's standards, I mean, I know a lot of people with gaming boxes that blow that away, right? Run SCSI drives. I process 80,000 emails a day. Only about 8,000 of them were valid. And they run the spam tactics. I don't go over 10% CPU. On, on user process, I don't think I run over half a percent. So you're not really going to overburden the, uh, the, uh, the, mail, the mail scanner, unless you put it on like a Pentium or, uh, you know, Something like that. So, hope that answered the question. Yes. Top servers and such aren't very susceptible to worms and everything else, but what about web based email? Yahoo. Well, email. that's, that's going to go down to the MUA. Um, your MUA, in the case of Gmail, okay, is going to be a web-based client. And there's really no stopping a virus. I mean, if your ISP isn't checking it, guess what? You're downloading that virus. And now the only thing that's going to catch that virus is a client antivirus system. Okay? And again, if we go back to our best practices, our best practices are going to dictate that you have a firewall or some egress filtering on your client. Now, you should, you know, in, any, in any secure network, you should... You should form the layers of security like an onion, OK? And you should build them outward. So your client systems are going to be your end system that your user is going to deal with. You want to have, at bare minimum, some kind of firewalling system that looks by application that says, hey, it's fine for Outlook to send stuff out on port 25, but I'm going to alert the user if you know, a regular executable sends something out on port 25. Right? And then you get the Windows dialog box, accept, reject. You remember the Mac commercial? right? 
right? And, but it's going to in, inform the user that there's something happening on their machine that isn't quite right, okay? And that's built into XP, not Vista, okay, as, as of Service Pack 2. As far as downloading a worm or a virus from a web-based client, the only thing that's going to stop that is your client's antivirus, okay? There's no spam fighting that you can do there. You're going to get that information. The good thing is you don't have to download it all. Now, with POP clients, you can actually put an ad in. I think Cloudmark makes one that will actually look at the stuff coming down from the POP server. And as it comes down, it will actually filter through it. The problem, again, is you're filtering it right on that client. So you're running the CPU time up. You've got to dial up, pack a lunch, eat your Wheaties. You ain't going to see it for a week, right? So you're still downloading it. But those are the MUAs. Um, in this, this is the best solution because you're actually putting it before it gets to the ISP server. Now, we don't have any control over ISP, but if you are running an ISP. So I hope that answered your question. Yep. Any other questions? Yes? <laughs> How does this solution handle redundancy? If the mail scanner gateway goes down, you are pretty much completely sitting ducks until you actually get it back up and running again, am I right? Yes, but there's two things. There's two things, and if you don't follow the best practices, okay, then yeah, you're going to be basically handcuffed. Uh, one, you can add a second server, and in your firewall, let's go back to that slide here. Okay, I'll just leave that up because it's going to start from the beginning. Um, at the firewall, you'll open up a second port 25 to a second mail scanning gateway. On the outside in your DNS, you'll set up two MX records, one primary with a 10, second MX with a 20, and then if the first one isn't available, it'll automatically load over to the second. Okay, that's first technique. That's if you want to take matters into your own hands. But let's say, you know, you're a small company, you don't want to set up two of these servers because that's a pain, right? What you could do is you could actually go out to your ISP, a lot of ISPs, good ISPs, not like, uh, well, I'm not going to say names, uh, a lot of good ISPs will actually give you backup mail capabilities so that rather than put in that second IP inside your facility, which is a good thing, but in some cases it's a bad thing because if your entire network goes down, guess what? You're losing all that mail if it doesn't retransmit in the given period of time SMTP dictates. Okay? In that instance, I always say, go to your ISP, get a backup mail server. Okay? What's going to happen is your primary record is going to go to you your secondary record is going to go to your backup at your ISP on the other side of your WAN connection. If your connection fails, it's not going to be able to contact you. It's going to go to your backup server. Your backup server is going to hold that mail and tell that user that, yes, the mail has been delivered. And then when you come back online, it's going to spit all that mail back at you. Okay? So that's the redundancy part with mail. But those are just best practices. In Mail Scanner itself, the only redundancy is setting up a second server, putting in a second DNS entry, but yeah, you can do it. So. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, generally, what's your success rate for blocking spam using these systems, oh. and uh, what's your false positive versus false negative rates? Uh, that's, that's a great question. Uh, it all depends on who you talk to, <laughs> and because the tests that I've run, I've got 98% success, okay? But you're still going to get that 2% of you know, pump and dump spam. Right now I'm working with a facility that's undergoing a pump and dump scam where they're sending penny stocks, right? And it's like, hey, put money in this stock. Uh, we're seeing a lot of, you know, come through the system. So we're seeing about 2%. Uh, on the other side of that, the false positives, I should say false negatives, um, we're seeing about less than 1%. So... You know, and that's mainly like mail, mail groups. You know, you get on a mail server and it's sending something through. We had one instance where a, an education website or a mail group was actually being denied. And you just go in, whitelist it, bang, you're golden. Okay, but it didn't fail by much. And it was really the content that they put in the email and how they fa forged that email rather than the actual sender. So, tell you what, I'm actually, I think I'm running close on time because we have a presentation at two. But uh, can I take one more question? Really quick. Okay, so one more really quick question. Any takers? All right. All right. Well, I hope I hope I've inspired some people to go back and then you know throw up a Linux box and a Linux gateway, and uh, really enjoyed talking at the conference. So.
Thank you. Test. One, two, three. So is it going up? One, two, three, four. What?